Thank you very much, Dan. It's, it's an honor to be here. And this lecture could be given by any one of you, so I'll just humbly say what it means to me <laughs> uh, to be an instrument in the way God has blessed in my life, in my practice. <coughs> when we think about instruments as surgery, we can think about actually even the surgical suite design and, and the staff we use and the microscopes and the surgical instruments. And then our, our fingers, our hands, our eyes, our feet, our mind, just how healthy we are. But beyond that, I think uh, elements of surgery are the surgeon's conscientiousness and caring, the attitude we bring to surgery. So I'll review a few ways that God inspires, provides, guides, directs, and forgives us his instruments. <coughs> God has inspired each of us to do what we now do and provided the means to get us where we are and promised to guide us as we do his will. And this includes guiding us in surgery for sure. <clears throat> he directs our minds and our hands <clears throat> as we serve him through serving others. And God forgives us when we confess to mistakes that hurt us, our family, our our staff, and our patients. <clears throat> and he expects and enables us to grow and learn from those mistakes. And we can share those experiences with others to help them. I'll never forget a presentation by uh, Bill Fishkind at a meeting once where he showed a serious complication. He was hydrating and it wouldn't seal and so he thought he'd just hydrate up into the roof of the incision and got a great big decimase detachment. And I thought, how courageous to share that with all the rest of us. But what a blessing it's been to us. And personally, I can't do hydrodissection without thinking about that. Uh, not hydrodissection, but uh, stromal hydration. And <clears throat> make sure I stay in the angles and not anywhere near the, the roof of the incision. So I thank God and I thank you for this opportunity to praise him for what he has done in my life and practice. Just to review some of God's blessings in my life, <clears throat> an inspiration to take medicine rather than stay on the farm. Those farm experiences as a youth have been of value in surgery. And I praise God for a dedicated God, a talented, dedicated and caring wife who's blessed our practice with her administrative skills, her personal support, staff training. She developed this uh, ophthalmic assisting guide that some of you may have taken advantage of as well, <coughs> and uh, brought health education into our practice that I'll elaborate a little more in the future. And he blessed me with the courage to be an early adapter <coughs> and uh, in, give innova innovative ideas in surgical techniques and delivery of care as well with a family observing through a glass wall in the operating room. I visited Jim Gill's practice in Florida to have the inspiration to develop a surgical center and he had a, he had a window that the family could look into the operating room and that was the first time I had seen that. And <clears throat> when we worked with our uh, designer to develop ours, I said, why does it just have to be a window? Could it be a whole wall? Well, sure, we can make the whole wall. So where the family sits, there's just a glass wall between them and the operating room, as well as the, <clears throat> the monitor. So my desire has been to express my faith through the works of love, like we read in James 2.14. And our motto right from the start of our practice has been always do what's best for the patient, which includes adequate time with the patient in the clinic and in surgery, and a sacrifice to provide state-of-the-art equipment and well-trained staff. I'm grateful for a simple farm 
experience where I grew up with no electricity or plumbing and a barn where we milk cows. And this is a air, uh, an aerial view <coughs> with the new house that was built with plumbing finally when I was about 17. Then we moved the old house, which was just like about three granaries put together, back for storage. We used to haul our grain to these elevators. I had one younger sister, four, four older living siblings. This is our family when I was an early teen. Here's the school I went to. It was a two-grade school in the upper room, teacher, six to 10. This dedicated teacher that, uh, that really was a blessing in my life. There was only one other classmate in grade 10. <clears throat> little cart where we went to school two and a half miles away with two older sisters and the teacher behind me there. When my older brothers left school, then I got to drive the cart. <laughs> On the way home, the, we could just drop the reins. The horse knew where to go. And on the farm, chores are demanded by nature, not a boss. Chickens have to be fed, the eggs gathered, cows fed and milked, and got to make hay for them in the summer. And all the chores of seeding and harvest, that's demanded by nature, not just because you have a job. We milked by hand early on in my life, but then <coughs> when dad had to get more income to get the put the kids through school, <coughs> got a milking machine and increased the herd to about 15 cows that we milked uh, twice a day. But those experiences on that farm equipment where we were working early on, probably in age 11 or 12, we were on tractors, developed eye-hand foot coordination that I think was a blessing and this is after I was in practice, I had to go back and get a little farm experience. And again, an example of uh, eye-hand foot coordination where you have hydraulics and clutches and brakes and steering and so forth. My interest in physics, um, I relate to wondering why, what caused a mirage where the mountains suddenly became real high when they were just little bumps on the horizon otherwise. And the phone wires were tight in the winter and loose in the summer and ice would disappear with sublimation without any thawing. So I chose a physics major in college and <clears throat> I thank God that he kept my interest in medicine because my dad needed me on the farm. All the older brothers had gone. I loved music, singing male quartets, and I would have joined a quartet if that could have been a career. And I thought about dentistry because I liked working with my hands. Trombone was my first instrument, college male quartet, college band, switched instruments. <laughs> but now, all those instruments are abandoned except a cutting instrument, because surgeons have to use a cutting instrument, don't they? This is the musical saw, not played on the cutting edge, on the cutting side of it, but <laughs> the decision to, make, to take medicine was influenced by a physician uncle and medical student brother. My wife, Judy, has been a partner in medical school and practice as well as mother of our five children. I'm so blessed. She would have been a good partner in farming as well, I'm sure, if I'd have chosen that career. In medicine, when I got to <clears throat> the physiology lab, many of my buddies were cringing at physiology, but it, it was a welcome relief for me as a physics major because here was we were dealing with laws and objectivity rather than a new language and memorization and so forth. And then when I got to the clinic the uh, junior year and looked at an eye through a slit lamp it just it just immediately settled the question I was going to be an ophthalmologist so I took ophthalmology at the White Memorial Medical Center in Los Angeles 
in uh, 61 and 64. And we were doing intracapsular cataract surgery, no IOLs. I learned scleral buckle from the retinal uh, surgeon trained by Otto, uh, Dr. Skeppens, Otto Young Schaefer, and some of you may have known him. But the Calgary practice was my decision. Close to family and farm, and now I own the farm and the machinery, and a nephew farms it for me. And machines have gotten bigger, and <clears throat> it's changed as much as cataract surgery has with the size of equipment and so forth. Here's our family in 2004. We have five children, 12 grandchildren, and in 2008. Just an overview of the practice. As I said, we did strabismus and intra, intra that uh, should be intra, yeah, intra, not intracap, but ex, yeah, just bring out the whole lens for the first 10 years. <laughs> And took Kelman's, Kelman's course in 74. IOLs started in 75. Out of hospital surgery in 84 and started RK that same year. PRK in 90, LASIK in 95, ICL in 97. Camera inlays 2014 and I've just recently explored the smile refractor procedure. As I said last night, I was labeled gimbal, uh, gadget gimbal because I was uh, picking up all this technolo technology as a physics major. I trusted it as others didn't. And this is that big autorefractor, the first one of QD systems, where you seem like you're a mile away from the patient. But it was so effective, especially in children, which I was doing a lot of in that, in those days. It was more accurate than my retinoscopy. <clears throat> but phaco emulsification came along in 74 and that was quite a wave. And then intraocular lenses. I took the course in 74, but after that course, that first international course in, in Holland, uh, the surgeons that were there from around the world just ordered lenses and I never thought of doing that, I guess. The lens of my first implant was in 75. And CCC in 85, but <clears throat> it's about the same size, but a big difference in safe surgery and safe IOL placement. And that technique demanded and allowed the development of the divide and conquer technique. Dr. Kelman told me he had early on tried splitting the lens, but the way he was doing the Christmas tree capsulotomy at that time, you know, it would just encourage the uh, capsule to split and drop the nucleus, so he gave that up. Judy brought in health education to the office with hiring a doctor of public health, which we had on staff for almost nine years. <clears throat> he also had a subspecialty training in nutrition and health education. We did staff wellness programs, lunch and learn, health Olympics, patient wellness, education and coaching. And actually we had some retinal specialists on board that demonstrated improvement in AMD, Drusen. Our health education source is book of min uh, the book Ministry of Healing, which Judy and I have shared since courtship, and it's blessed our lives with advice. And we have a paper copy. We got a couple of boxes of these. They're at the registration desk so that each one of you can take one home with you. So just ask at the registration desk, and also I have pr these prayer cards that I mentioned last night that you can take as well. So. We have rested and worshiped one day in seven all our lives, and both got MPH degrees. We've been vegetarians since married, vegan vegetarians the last 26 years. 
moderate regular outdoor work and exercise is my view. I think we've run out of time, have we? Five more minutes. Judy, why don't you come up and, and share some special stories of God's grace in our practice. I think each one of us would say, we want them to, our patients to know uh, that we are Christians by our love. This, there's a wonderful hymn called, yeah, of those, those same words, oh, that they will know that we are Christians by our love. So one very special story. This was a, a young woman that came for laser surgery, and she said, I'm privileged to have you perform my surgery but I also want to thank you for the care you gave my grandma. Several years ago, when she was in her 80s, she needed cataract surgery. You treated her as a person, not as a patient, and made what could have been a very traumatic experience for her, a woman suspicious of everyone. Feels, anyway, she felt something I think she searched her whole life for. She passed away two years ago at the age of 95, and as I reflect on what I, I know about her life, I can only recall one story that she ever told me that she had a sense of peace. Is it, oh, a sense of, of peace to it rather than anxiety. It was about more than words. It was about a feeling she told me about this doctor who prayed for her. And with her before her surgery, I sensed that she felt from you a sense of security, compassion, understanding, and acceptance, a genuine, sincere concern for her as a human being a person I don't know of any other time in grandma's life that she had felt that way. And then the, the, it's a long letter, it talks about her being born in Poland to a large family. You know, she, had, she was so much dependent on each one of the children working so hard, she came to Canada. She had married someone that treated her very poorly and she ended up being a very, a very unhappy woman, and this grandchild ch uh, expresses that very clearly. It sounded as though pretty much of all responsibility for caring for feeding, clothing, and disciplining, etc., fell on Grandma's shoulders. Grandma had always seemed to me to be a bitter, angry, critical, unforgiving, suspicious woman, someone no one and nothing could please. Each, then she tells about how the children trying to make their mother happy. Because of your kindness to Grandma and God's grace, I am now able to look at her with compassion, acceptance, and empathy rather than criticism, judgment, and sympathy. Her great faith, strong will, and determination carried her through her last years of life. Her story will now be shared as one of a survivor rather than a victim, giving her the respect she deserved. You st your skill and hands have given me 2020 vision and your heart has given me clarity as I have never had it before. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And the other story is about, you know, I was hearing all the stories about patients and far too busy to ever have any kind of patient contact. So, but I got the stories. Howard was so open about what was going on in his life. And I heard this story about interocular lens in children. And he was having, he was being extremely careful how he did that and who he chose to do it on and when he did it. But he, not, it didn't matter. It, it seemed like the pediatric surgeons were just saying, uh uh, uh uh, uh uh. And it kind of got my motherly part of me sort of 
in overdrive, and I said, somebody has to do something about this. We're having success. Why aren't the rest of them following? And so I had this idea. I said to Howard, we were having a, an annual meeting called the Canadian Rocky Symposium. And a year after year, with doctors would come in from all over the world in the mount, into that beautiful Banff city and, uh, and uh, bless us with their wisdom. I said to him, look, at one of those meetings, why don't you bring in a of uh, uh, the, the only ophthalmologists that you know are that, that are putting IOLs in and would bring some pediatric ophthalmologists that don't believe in it. And so we brought them and they presented to each other. There was four on one side and four on the other. And they didn't know, but we had eight patients in the next room with slit lamps. <laughs> and after they presented to each other, and Howard presented, then they said, would you like to see some of the outcomes? And they came into the room and I stood by the door and it was so very, very fascinating and overwhelming really to see each one of them when they came out of the room said, you made us believers. And we're, I really believe that that did have a little bit of a influence on the, the ophthalmic community, so. God bless you. I think it's really special that you come together for this meeting, and we're honored to be here. Thank you all very much. Yes, and thank you for your continued prayers as I continue to practice long after the average surgeon and a bit after Judy wishes I would, too. <laughs> <laughs>